<laughs> no. <laughs> no, n- absolutely no regrets. There's not, a, I have, not for a single day have I regretted that choice. Um, okay. So uh, what we're going to do today is um, I'm going to give you a presentation on the research question. We're going to go a little bit... Uh, over the the artistic research in general, and then I'm gonna we're gonna go in, into detail about how the research question works. Um, and then at ten thirty, we have a presentation from Miriam Iris from the library here. So she's gonna talk to us a little bit about the resources we have available to us, uh, which you are going to be using. Did everybody write their motivation and some questions for their research? Could be more elaborate, I think. Okay. Uh, um, I've designed this course, so we're going to go chuck, 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 and we have uh, homework each week, things to do, and a lot of thinking, a lot of reflection you guys need to do to choose your topic. So in a way, this is an important moment to uh, to be triangulating what you want to do these couple years. So we need to keep that moving. It's not a thing that you can just uh, uh, fill in, right? So like in, you know, the deadline for your proposal is December 2nd, but you can't write it on December 1st because you have all this work to do. You have to make a recording. You have to do some interviews. So uh, we have to kind of keep the, keep the ball rolling. So that's all, all I will say about that. Uh, would you like to do your push-ups now yeah. or later? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it with you. I have to leave at Okay, we're going to have like group push-ups in about 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, then you get to do 20. Okay. Uh, right, so just a few basic points. We're talking about practice-based research. So researching, uh, th- these are some kind of uh, bullet points I grabbed from someone else. So let's kind of talk through them. You know, researching, reflecting, and making explicit, right? So as, we, as, uh, as I say, every time you play your instrument, you're researching. You're practicing how to have better technique, how to have a better tone, play better in tune, make an interpretation. That is also research. Um, But making it explicit is then the part of artistic research or the the full definition of research. So that means you're not only are you doing the research, but you're making it explicit for yourself and for others. So this is why you're going to write a thesis is to tell us about your art and the things you've discovered, things you've learned and the things you've developed. See if I can get the screen in there. Uh, research comes from your musical practice and flows back into it, right? So um, your, 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 of course, your topic, as we talked about last week, topic comes out of your practice. You're going to do all the work, the learning and research, and then that goes back into your practice. So at the end, you have, a, you have developed as an artist. And, and we don't necessarily say you're better, but you're, you're developed because it can go like that sometimes. Sometimes someone will make a first recording and it's already awesome. And then they do a, a big study into interpretation and they make another recording, which is also awesome, but has a different interpretation to it. So, so that's also a possible way. Um, right? The ideal, the researching musician and the performing researcher. So as a part of your research, you're gonna have to perform. So uh, we are making a recording, a reference recording at the beginning, and then after you're at the end, you're gonna have another recording. So you're gonna perform your research. Those of you who might have pedagogical researches, then you might have a method, teaching method, which is then a second version of that. So that can also be your quote-unquote, performance. 
uh, integration with your main subject. Uh, you know, again, we talked about this last week. Uh, the uh, the research definitely, as a matter of fact, this is going to be your homework for this week. Is going to take your research topic to your main teacher and interview them about it. So you have to get them on board, and and you guys are going to be part of the the generation of students who's going to start convincing all the teachers here how awesome the research is. Because right now that's pretty separate, but we need to get that more integrated. Where I teach in Rotterdam, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's really, the main teachers are really involved and in they're at all the exams and feedback sessions. So, so uh, and they really get excited about it too. So this is what you guys are going to do. Um, Practice-based results should be noticeable in your performance, measurable. We talked about that. Measurability, that's why we do the two recordings, the first recording and the second recording. Not only do you talk about it, but you're going to show it. So we listen to the recording and we see, wow, that interpretation is much uh, clearer or uh, is really different than where you started out. Um, and then your goal to become a better, more interesting, and more independent artist. <laughs> I really like the word independent here because it fits with this phrase that I always say, which is that artistic research is that process that turns craftsmen into artists, right? So you're, you're going deep into some subject which is close to your heart and you're researching it and you're developing it. And then at the end, all of a sudden you become this expert in that topic which no one else is an expert in. And so, you know, when, when someone's making an ensemble or whatever, they see this knowledge and they say, wow, that's really interesting, this uh, person's uh, approach to orchestral excerpts or to Tchaikovsky or to their creative uh, uh, process. And uh, I want to have that vision on my team because that's going to make my team stronger, right? So you guys are... You're becoming specialists with this process, and that's gonna uh, that's gonna be something unique that you have. Just to go over the no go areas, right? First of all, musicological research is not what we're doing. It's what these guys are doing because they're musicologists at the university, but we are doing artistic research. So, and as I always say, there's a lot of musicology. Uh, tools, musicological tools, which we are using. So these guys have a lot to teach us about that. But our process is going to be different. So uh, what I don't want is someone to say, uh, how do you do uh, correct Baroque ornamentation? You know, that would be a, like a some kind of musicological research. Or what is the uh, how, did da how did David Bowie create his uh, artistic persona, right? That's musicology. You can study that, you can analyze it, you can make your interpretation. But the artistic research would be, how can I take, how can I create my persona through, or how can I refine my persona through looking at the, the theatrical stage presence of uh, David Bowie, Nick Cave, and Lady Gaga, for example, right? Then you go analyze all those, and then learn something from that, which then you would put into, you would work their ideas into your stage presence. Okay, research that has no relevance to you as a performer, right? So that's also no go. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there was someone last year who wanted to, a violinist. Who's your, who are the string players here? Are there any string players? Great. So there was a violinist who wanted to study the, the, the you know, the, how the violinists have this dot on their neck, right? Because they're all, and she works, she worked in like a science lab. And she said, oh, I want to, I want to research that dot and, and see what the cause of it is and all that. And, and, and her mentor was like all for it. It's like, wow, this could be a really great research and to, for us to learn something about that. But indeed, it would have been, but it was, a, first of all, it was science. And like, science will bury you the minute you want to try to do science, right? Because it's really technical. And, uh, um, and I just couldn't find the relationship to her art 
like what would that mean i mean okay maybe then she would then use the violin without the tin rest or something i, I don't know it was just too it was too vague unclear and uh wasn't uh, research so i couldn't we vetoed that Okay, number three, therapy. Like I said, your research is not to solve a problem. If you're a violinist and you have body tension, don't research how to get rid of body tension. Because in, in the, the, this is where this idea of measurability becomes really clear. Because you might make a first recording of Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto, and then you do all your research, and then we get a new recording, and it's better. And then you say, yeah, I did all this Alexander technique and meditation and stuff like that. And look, I'm better. But how do I know that? Like, I can't see inside your, I can't see your mind. So, and, and you also practiced for two years. So you might have just gotten better by practicing, right? So this is why we have to put it into a more artistic thing. When it's this, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, there are also mindfulness, meditation. These are really hot topics right now. So almost impossible to research artistically. Or like focus, right? Let's say I want to, I, you know, I'm always, uh, I always have trouble concentrating in my performances. So I want to I wanna do a research. How can I make better focus uh, in my performances? So what do you do? You make a first recording where you're like, I don't know, looking around, <laughs> unfocused. <laughs> And then you make your second recording where you're like this. It's Latin American soul. Yeah, what, what is that in English? It's just, it's, just, it's not, you know. It, it, what? Bonkers. It's bonkers. <laughs> That's perfect. Right. So anyway, the therapy, you know, also I had a student, a violinist, who wanted to take sports medicine and, and sport training methods as a way to improve his uh, violin playing. And also, it was just really, uh, it was so, hard. yeah, I, what's the word? It, it wasn't bonkers, but it was really hard to make sense of it. So just stick it to your art. Keep it to your art and what you do and show us that and then develop it and then show us a new version. And then it's all really clear. Within that world, there's the world of variation. So you have plenty of... Uh, um, possibilities. The last no-go is purely main subject. So some people want to do, want to get a job in an orchestra and they say, oh, I want to do my research on uh, our orchestral excerpts because, you know, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. And then that is something that you do with your teacher. You're learning your excerpts. And so that's not a research. So but if you were going to say, I want to compare uh, Berlin, Amsterdam, and Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and I want to look at the, the, the way cellists uh, approach Beethoven in those orchestras. Or, for example, this is one I've actually had, uh, a tuba player who did a com he's doing a comparison of Russian uh, and Dutch tuba playing. And his, his, his teacher is a tuba player in the Rotterdam Philharmonic. And so now, then he really goes in and he's developing a real, uh, uh, he's becoming a specialist in the Russian approach to tuba playing and the Dutch approach. And, and of course he can play all the excerpts and he can, he can play it in that way and that way and stuff, but it's more than just learning the excerpts and being able to play them correctly. It's really becoming a specialist. So sometimes these orchestral studies, they could, they could like look at traditions within specific orchestras. And that's where the word specificity <laughs> uh, really makes a big difference. So if you say, oh, how, how do cello players uh, play an orchestra? That's just too broad. But if you want to say, well, I want to compare the, the traditions of these two orchestras, then you all of a sudden it starts to take on its own relevance and, and become much more interesting and, and unique. Okay, any questions about any of that? Yeah, last thing what you said, what, what, was the, uh, what made it specific? Mm. Well, there was like studying the, uh, the traditions in different orchestras. 
And so then you would say, well, like the tuba player, he would say, um, uh, you know, in Amsterdam they play the, the notes of this particular piece really short, and then in Russia they play them really heavy and loud or something like that. Or, yeah, because he became a special, he's, now he's an expert. Yeah. And so when he goes to teach his students, he says, well, you know, this is the way we play it. They would play it in Russia. And he would, you know, and this is the way they play it here. And this is the way they play it in Chicago. And, you know, and, and so then you get it, right? Now he has this knowledge, which um, nobody else has. A niche. It's a niche. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so you guys have to, you have to figure that out. What is, the, where do you want to, be, what do you want to become a specialist in? And as I always say, it's not something you want to learn, but it's a it's a, a enriching enriching and going deeper into something which is already in you. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to the research question. Mm. A research question is a clear, focused, concise, complex an arguable question that exactly defines what you are going to research. Right? So, you have your motivation, which is your story. You have your topic, which is the general field. I'm going to study traditional Polish folk music. And then you have your research question. How can I incorporate traditional Polish traditions into my new compositions, for example? Right? So then we are, just to make up some random example, <laughs> that was Zosia's uh, bachelor's topic. So you, you have, uh, and she's from Poland, right? So then that's her motivation. She, she grew up in Poland, maybe she heard some folk music, but she never learned it particularly, and now she wants to go back to her roots and then, and then work that into her, vision, into her artistic vision. And so that's the motivation. Or uh, uh, motivation is uh, uh, I always I always loved the Russian style of tuba playing. I heard Saint Petersburg Philharmonic once, and I fell in love with their approach to brass. Often, your motivation is a single event that happened in your past, in where something that you you were really inspired by, and never fully did anything with, and this would be the moment to then. Uh, go for that. Um, so that's your motivation. And then your topic is the general area. So that's usually a few words, but it can also be uh, uh, something more specific. Uh, um, you know, late Beethoven piano sonatas or something, and uh, and the tempi between. Uh, uh, choosing the right tempi for the movements and then analyzing uh, different performers. So anyway, that's your, that's your topic. And then you have your question, which is then very specific, really clear. And we're going to look at a bunch of questions today. <clears throat> the research question for you helps you focus your research by providing a path through the research and writing process, right? So that's uh, your question. The method of your research is going to come out of your research question. And then for others, it helps them understand what you're going to research. And this is a thing, huh? So like, I don't know, I have like, what is it, 80, 100? I don't know, I have so many people I'm coaching now who are doing research. And the first thing I want to do is, is read the question. Okay, ah, okay, that's what we're, okay. And then once I know the question, then I can understand everything else in the paper, in the topic, or whatever, the methods. And so, th like this thing about the research question is uh, helping others to understand is, is really a thing. Also, it really helps you with your elevator pitch, right? You're in the elevator, uh, and you want to tell about what you're researching. Well, I'm researching uh, uh, the identity of speed in music. 
Actually, that's a vague question. <laughs> that's my research question. I know. I know. It's a different thing, PhD. It's, it, it's, uh, it has too many, so many facets. So it's something about the expressive possibilities of speed in music. That would be, how can I uh, make use of the expressive possibilities of speed in, mu in my own music and performance? That would be my research question. It's still vague, but that's a big topic and it's a PhD research, right? So then you guys, this is something I've also learned is we do have these different size uh, researches. So the bachelor's research, the master's and then the PhD. And for those of you who really get into this, it might be something to think about to go into your PhD eventually. Because uh, uh, I never thought about that because I'm, I'm very much a, uh, a performer and a composer, but at one point, I just had all this experience and the PhD was a really great uh, structure for me to codify it all. Okay. I think what you just said also gave me a clear set of questions I would ask you to clarify it. Yeah. So if, if, it's, if it's too broad, I would be like, where do I start? And right now I'd be like, oh, do you mean this or do you mean this? Yeah. And that also makes it clear. Yeah. Clear. So in the second half of this class, after we take the break, we will break off in groups and you guys can tell each other your topics and your ideas and your possible questions and you can ask these questions. So it help to try to refine it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can say well anything on short. You might have Nederlands Oh, okay. <laughs> so if, uh, try in English. Okay. Um, does it have to be in one sentence? Because I had like one sentence and then I have different um, yeah, sub questions. Yeah, but, but I don't know. Sometimes in research they want, like, I come from the uh, education, that it's all in one sentence, but it doesn't have to be. Or can I also wonder? I, I, I think you should try to get the, 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 the full essence of it yeah. in one sentence. Yeah. And then you can have some sub questions that might have some yeah. branches to it. But to, honestly, I think the, no, the, 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 the main question, it should all be there and all the sub questions should be inferred or they would be part of your method yeah. to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, in general, I don't, I'm not so into the sub questions, yeah. but I understand yeah. how you also think of them. And I also understand the process where you might write 10 different questions and then you kind of have to choose one as your main and the others as a sub-question and stuff. That's more that, like, okay, I have a question and, and uh, the sub-things were like, how I'm going to, uh, uh, what, what I'm going to do to... Well, there you go. That's your method. Yeah. Those are the, and so how are you going to answer that question? And yeah. absolutely, you need, to, you need to think of that. Yeah, and the, the question has to be bigger and then I can... It has to, yeah. it has to fit yeah. all of those yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. So here's some guidelines for your research questions. The research question should be practice-based and have a practical outcome. It's about you and your artistic practice. Oh yeah, in this second line. And if, if you have a performance practice domain, it would be about your specific repertoire. So if you're a classical musician and you want to study um, uh, Isai, uh, violin, piece, uh, Sonata number two, then you say, how can I create a, a theatrical performance of Isai's Violin Sonata number two? Boom. Very specific. We talk about theatrical performance and we talk about the piece. And then we can know what to do. You gotta go analyze the piece, you need to create a, a, a dramaturgy, all that stuff. Number two, uh, your research question, um, Contributing to knowledge, skills, understanding, and that of others. That's a really vague sentence. Um, the, the result, the answer to the question should contribute to knowledge, right? So this is what I'm always talking about. With the artistic research, we're talking about unearthing your personal knowledge. What is it that you see in music? And, and trying to explain that because right? we are all unique individuals. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it doesn't need to be important for other people. It no. Be important for me. Yeah. Myself. Yeah. I don't care if it contributes to other people. No. As long as it contributes to me. That's right. It's yeah, absolutely. But yeah, uh, right. There's a lot of artistic research which is just not interesting for me, and then there are some that are. No. So, but if you want to say. I, I want to uh, I want to do a research into the very first note of every improvisation that I make, right? For example, so then you're researching like a single note, and then you would create a whole. Actually, that probably would be interesting for a lot of people. <laughs> so, but uh, I don't know. Sometimes we say uh, you could do a whole research into one note of a Beethoven sonata if if there was enough. Uh, interesting things in there and that you know if it's a piano sonata then maybe it's not interesting for a non-pianist anyway so your question should neither be too broad nor too narrow so for two years so uh, uh, I don't know what would be a too broad uh, too narrow question would be like um uh, how can I cue the downbeat of uh, of the beginning of this sonata, right? So it's like that or like that, right? This is something you could do in a week or even one day. Um, but then again, if you want to say, um, uh, how can I develop an interpretation to uh, the entire well-tempered clavier by Bach? that would be then maybe too big for two years because you have 24 pieces and all that stuff. So, uh, so you have to think about it. And we can, we will, I will read all your questions. So we'll, we will also kind of find the right size of your question. Uh, should be manageable. So the sources should be findable, manageable, and the methods practically possible. So... Yeah, this is a, you know, the, the kind of one example you might say, oh, yeah, when I was uh, 10 years old, I heard this uh, Tuvin soloist doing the overtone singing. And uh, anyway, he died 10 years ago, and uh, there are no recordings of him, and, uh, uh, and nobody knows him, and I can't go to tuba. And uh, so if you say, how can I incorporate this guy's language into my own performing it's just not possible because the guy's dead. No, there's no record, you know, right? So there's just the information isn't there. So that would be an example of something which is not findable. Um, uh, methods practically possible. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe a silly example would be like, you know, what's it like to sing on the moon or something like that, right? <laughs> how can I, how can I, how can I incorporate the weightlessness into my own performance? Well, maybe you could do something like that. I don't know. But uh, in any case, you get the idea. Uh, the research question should be clear, understandable to you and to others with clearly defined concepts. Everybody in your field should know what they mean, right? So as you understand, you know, a lot of the examples I'm just making up right now you guys get it right away because you're musicians. We speak the same language. And uh, uh, so that also needs to be clear, right? Uh, should be focused, defining, limiting the scope of your research. So, you know, there uh, should be clear that there's an end to it, uh, which we'll come back to in a second. Uh, concise, so you don't write a story. So your question is, um, you know, it shouldn't be three or four sentences long, or it shouldn't also be 500 words. It's always a really clear, concise form. And we will look at some uh, sentences, uh, questions in a minute. Um, the question should be complex. There should be a challenge, right? So... Don't just ask the question for something you already do, right? So I'm always talking about taking something that you're good at 
and 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 going deeper into that. But it shouldn't only it shouldn't only be a codification of what you did till now, right? So uh, uh, you know, I'm really good at Beethoven sonatas, so I want to. How do I play Beethoven sonatas? And then you would just do that. But you know, it should be something more challenging. So how can I um, how can I take the the forte piano? How can I take the original instrument Beethoven wrote for and create a new interpretation based on how that piano works, right? So then we have something we can sink our teeth in and grow. So, so when you're thinking of your question, it really should be something that you want to learn and develop. It's not only a clarification of your past. Uh, it should be arguable, possible, and worth arguing about. Uh, it has to be researchable. It's all kind of related. Um, and there are a couple things which are not on this list. I'm going to change this for next year. Uh, your research question needs to be answerable. So at the end of these two years, you have to have answered your question. Now I know. When I play Beethoven's Sonata, I, you know, it, it's so different on a Steinway than it is on a forte piano. So I'm, I'm taking a, a different approach to tempos and... Uh, and the, the, the lower register has a completely different sound on the forte piano than on the modern piano. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create an articulation that creates a more buzzier sound, right? Boom. So now you've listed all the things that, uh, that, are, that answer that question of how can I take a, 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 the original instrument and create a an, uh, historically informed interpretation of uh, of Beethoven on a modern instrument. So you have to think about that. Make sure your question is answerable. Now it's also true that in research, that every time you learn something, every time you answer one question, two questions pop up, right? Mm -hmm. Everything leads to something else. So that's okay. You just have to, uh, this is why we have to keep our question specific and, and finite, has to be able to get to an end. You need to be able to answer that. And at the end, usually in your conclusion of your thesis, you will write all the questions you didn't answer and all the questions that came up as a part of your research, which could be next steps for you or for somebody else, right? And you will see that in a lot of scientists. They will say, well, you know, I've, I've now answered... Uh, um, I don't know, some scientific thing. And then they'll say, but uh, I didn't answer this, and this also needs to be researched. Or, you know, like these, these like string theory, I don't know if anyone reads this like string theory physicist things. It's really great, I love it too. But they always talk about the things they know and the things they don't know. They're like, well, we have some clarity in this subject, but that infers that this may be true, but we haven't solved that question yet. It's like a really typical way of talking about it. So um, that's something for us to, to keep in mind with our research topics. And also, it, when you talk about it in those terms, it, it really shows that you understand the field well, because you know where the knowledge is and where the knowledge isn't, or not yet. Yeah? Could you go over number nine, the arguable one, a little deeper? I mean, it's just like, what are we trying to, what do you mean by arguing in terms of that part of the question? <laughs> yeah, well, right, so we're making an argument. So like, like the idea of the Beethoven thing, right? So, yeah. we're to, so I'm arguing that I can make a, I'm showing that I can make a new interpretation based on this, the, 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 the situation in which Beethoven wrote his pieces. And so then... You, you have to talk about why you've made those choices. And actually, this is, that's actually a nice point because um, we talk a lot about, in artistic research, the intervention, right? So when, if I look at, the, if I look at the, the process of the artistic research, which I've said many times, you have your, your, like we said, you have your motivation, your topic, your question, then you make your uh, uh, reference recording, 
then you do all the research on the basis of that. You get feedback, you reflect upon it, and then you, you do interviews, you do experimentation, you study some scores, you read some articles, you listen to some recordings, and then comes your intervention. And that's where you say, I've decided that I'm gonna play this piece slower and I'm gonna do a different articulation in order to answer that question. Right, so now you're arguing, and so that's the, 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 the intervention is your, where you take decisions. And you say, now on the basis of my research, I'm gonna do it like this. And we wanna know what those are I want, in detail. And it's this, and it's this, and I'm, I'm changing the articulation and the tempo. And when I play in the upper register, I play with a, a lighter touch because the pianos didn't sound, you know, whatever. You, but it's, it's all based on the, the research you did, which then you're, argue, you know, you're making the argument of why you did that. So we're defending ourselves against someone that may say, hey, I've been playing this Beethoven piece for the last 50 years, and I don't understand, or I don't get why you're doing what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah. And you could say, oh, well, based on my... Exactly. Yeah, you, 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 I mean, arguing is maybe it's not, it's a little that has other connotations. Yes. But you're, it's maybe explaining. Okay. Maybe explaining is a better word Evoke, for this. Evoking. evoking could be, yeah. Right. But, uh, it's, I have a question about the, the recording thing. Yeah. So it's, it's a clear example of, yes, I'm recording something that I'm doing right now, and I record it after two years, and I see how I improve based on my research. Yeah. But what if my research does not require me planning something? Then you have to change the research question. This is why we have to make the recording. It's because if I, in, 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 well, two things. First of all, you have to place yourself in the research question, right? It cannot be um, uh, a musicological question, like uh, um, what is, uh, how did Brahms, what is the harmonic language of Brahms, right? That would be a musicology study. But then how can, how can I take Brahms' approach to harmony and incorporate that in my compositions? That would be artistic research. So then literally you have the word I in your question. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be there. And then you have to make a recording. What? Well, that depends on your question, right? This question. How can I integrate um, Okay, so I'm a composer and I want to incorporate Brahms. So what I do is I, I take the last piece I wrote and that's my first recording. And then, we, you, then you, would, you would think about what you do harmonically. You would ask some composers, what did you think about my harmonic language in this piece? And they say, oh yeah, well, or even better, you would say, how would you compare my harmonic language to Brahms' harmonic language? And then they would say, yeah, well, you do this and you're too modern or whatever, you know. And then on the basis of that feedback and the basis of your own reflection, you would say, okay, I'm going to analyze uh, his symphonies and, uh, I don't know, some chamber music pieces to, under you know, to understand that. And then you would then, then you would compose some new music, which would use that. Now, in the case of a composer or maybe in 3.0, where you're making things, uh, it might not be one piece at the beginning and the same piece at the end. Mm -hmm. But it might, but in, in that case, we might be looking at some aspect of your music, which is apparent in the first recording and also apparent in the next recording. Mm -hmm. Like in the case of the composer, you would have a, you know, a, a chamber music piece for your first piece, and then your second, your final piece might be a piano sonata. But we're what we're looking at is the harm, harmonic language. So we have to kind of sort. You know, depending on your question, we we can see what the what the right uh, first recording would be. So it's a, kind of a different thing to, for everyone. Okay. Um, here's a formula which somebody wrote to how organize your thoughts. I am researching into the topic because I want to know the question, 
in order to, what is your, you know, have this goal or objective, and so that it serves the, the interest of my artistic development or something else. So, I mean, you, you, could, you could use this as an exercise for whatever you're thinking to see if you could fit it into. I, you know what? I'm going to put this, this PowerPoint online. I'll send you the link. So uh, okay. oh. now that you've retyped the whole thing, I tell you. Yeah. I still like writing. <laughs> it helps with remembering as well. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Although I don't have a pen now. But... Well, sometimes I say, don't write. Just be present and listen and think, right? But uh, it's also good to take notes. So I, and you have to do what works for you. Okay, let's look at some questions. Uh, Miriam Ears should be here soon, but we'll take five minutes for this. How can investigating and exploring relevant 18th century performance practices affect my own interpretation and transcriptions of J.M. Sperger's Sonata in D major on a modern double bass and viola? Okay, it's a, it's a mouthful, this one. Uh, but we have some method, investigate and explore uh, relevant 18th century practices, performance practices, to affect the, the interpretation and transcription of this Sperger's uh, sonata in D major, and then the instrument, double bass and viola. So it's very specific. Yeah. How can analyzing cello methods of Jean-Louis Duport and Bernard Romberg helped me to make my own interpretation of the cello sonata number three, opus 69, by Ludwig van Beethoven. Right? Dupour and Romberg, those were famous cellos, cellists, right? Who's the cellist over there? Right? You know, do you know those guys? Yes. Okay. So then you would study those methods, and then you, because uh, they were, you know, not long after Beethoven, I guess are from the time of Beethoven, I'm not sure. I don't know. I didn't read the research. I just have the question. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it, it is an actual research, so we could look at that. Uh, if you're interested in that, we can find that research. Right? So uh, I'm also going to... Eventually, we're going to look at a bunch of re previous researches and get access to all the previous research here. Miriam Iris will talk about that. And um, I know of a lot of stuff that's gone on in Rotterdam and there's the, in The Hague and in Amsterdam. All that master's research is online. So we're going to try to find people who have similar topics to you guys. And you can see how they did it. How can I expand my toolbox as a classical viola player and create an informed interpretation of Scottish tunes by exploring Scottish fiddle techniques and applying it to the modern viola? Okay, so this is a viola player, classical viola player who also likes to play, probably from Scotland or whatever, and, and then likes to play Scottish fiddle tunes. And then they're looking at the fiddle techniques and uh, uh, and actually the, the result of this is to play informed interpretation of Scottish tunes. He is a classical viola player and he's trying to play modern viola by learning more about the Scottish. Yeah. Well, I think that there are two things. Hey, Miriam. Hi. Uh, we zijn no, nog vijf minuten of so. That's good, Miriam. Zal ik gewoon bij gaan zitten? Absolute. You must go. So it's a good question. I, I don't really know, but what I'm, I, I think I'm, what I'm seeing in here is that they've done two things. They've created an informed tradition of the Scottish tunes, and they probably, they've looked at how that can be applied to a piece by Hindemith, modern viola piece, for example, right? So then they probably get some bowing techniques and they say, oh, well, that's interesting. New way to bow this Hindemith Sonata. So, um, often it's, it's a research, I see a lot of topics where you've got your thing and then you have something outside of it. And then you try to work the two. There's a there's sort of peanut butter chocolate 
thing. But, I mean, as, as a classical world, you have all the technique of the world. <laughs> Why would you need more technique? Well, maybe there's a certain technique, a certain way of bowing, which the, the classical violists don't use typically. Yeah. Right? Um, how can singing and playing fado melodies expand my tools to develop a more lyrical and expressive way of playing the violin? Right? So this is a Portuguese classical violinist who grew up uh, uh, hearing fado, and they, there's probably uh, some magic in the fado, which they want to then understand uh that's lyrical and expressive and they want to apply that to their to their playing of uh, uh of i guess classical violin it's not about playing becoming a, a a fado violinist it's about what can i learn from fado so like i was saying there's there's often that that chocolate and peanut butter thing i you know i really like peanut butter but oh i really like chocolate so i'm going to I'm going to put them together and see what the result is, right? How can I use this, uh, this case for my phone as a model for form in my compositions? So, I don't know. Which one? I, I, I don't know. Uh, so, these are... From school, right? Yeah, it's from Rotterdam, actually. So, I, I grabbed some from there. How can I create a historically informed interpretation of Amy Beach's violin sonata which contributes to make her work more accessible for others. So this is interesting. So there's, okay, Amy Beach is a modern composer, and then, or, or maybe it's early 20th century, I think. And so historically informed interpretation. So she's gonna go back, research what her language is, the way the music was performed, maybe who it was written for, what kind of, how that all went, and then She's going to learn that, and, and then she's going to disseminate it, so she's going to talk about it in a way that makes it more accessible for others. So I really like that point, you know, because it's not only am I doing the research, but I'm also explaining it so that when you go to, you know, learn Amy Beaches, or in my case, you do something with speed and music, you'll have a lot of tools based on what I've gone through to then you know, stand on my shoulders and then go higher, right? So this is the way we're building up knowledge. So but while... Are you learning more about any Beaches Island or we are learning about how you create historical informed and interpretation of something? Both. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, here's the tuba one, which I kind of talked about. How can I understand and apply the performing style of the tuba in the time of the Soviet Union concerning the 11th Symphony of Dmitry Shostakovich. Right, so here we have a specific piece. We have a style in the Soviet Union and, well, the tuba part. Uh, okay, here's a film composer. How can I develop my sound-related compositional language by analyzing the use of electroacoustic sounds in film scores by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Right, Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails. I guess he made some film scores. Uh, and they want to then take that into their electroacoustic pieces. So you study their, you know, you have your piece, your first piece, you study their pieces, you do some tests, and you come up with a new, a new piece which has, it was influenced by that. How can I improve control in my rhythm and bow technique through body percussion and body movement? Okay, so this is some string player, and I guess the, the rhythm and the bow technique is sloppy, and, and then they, and they really like body percussion, so they're going to do a bunch of body percussion exercises and apply that to the way they, uh, to their bowing. So now someone should say, yeah, but isn't that correcting a problem? <laughs> and you said it shouldn't be correcting a problem. Ah, right. <laughs> well, indeed, if it's just improving your rhythm and bow technique, uh, it would be shallow. So I'm assuming that this research went much deeper. And maybe this was the first version of the question. 
So that's also a thing. The questions. Uh, uh, oh, this is also a really interesting one. This was a student of mine. How can I play Emmy Frinzel Wechner's Suite to Minuetto for oboe and piano in an informed way by carrying out a performer's analysis based on a thorough analysis of her pieces in archival research? So this is a Dutch oboist, and she wanted to do something with female composers. And she found this obscure Dutch composer from the beginning of the or first half of the 20th century who wrote this oboe piece. She wrote several oboe, oboe pieces, and they had been played by several oboists in the last 10, 20 years. And the recordings were in an archive in The Hague. And, and so she got the piece, she started learning it, she analyzed the piece, you know, how does it work? You know, uh, and, but she also, now I'll come back to that, she also did a lot of archival research into Emmy Frenzel Wegener. So she went to some libraries, she found some letters and a bunch of photos. She found a, a little card which uh, from Boulanger, who she studied with in Paris. So, you know, all these, what we discovered was that this Emmy Fren uh, Frenzel Wegener was, was, you know, she fits in a long line of people who studied in Paris, you know, like Piazzolla and Philip Glass with Boulanger. And we are always talking about these men who went to Paris and studied with uh, Lydia Boulanger and became these great composers. But here we have a, a great example of a Dutch woman who also did that. And why aren't we talking about her? So, so there was a little bit of this... Uh, uh, well, shining a light on this this character or this this composer in the past, and 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 bringing you know putting it all together into a research. The difficult thing of her research, though, was like, what do you do with this historical information, and how does that affect the way she plays the piece today, right? Because we're, we're coming back to this measurability, you know, the first recording and the last recording. So, uh, so what she did for that is she, well, she looked at who the piece was written for, uh, this oboist, Statine, I think it was, or maybe that was his teacher, I, I, I forget the names. And then there was a certain oboe school, he was an oboist in the Concertgebouw back then, and he championed this piece. And then he had a certain way of playing the oboe, so she, she researched that and who are the people that studied with him or studied with his students and so that there was a, a, a clear line of oboe playing and then she which had a certain way of articulation and a certain way of making reads and so she was able to then use that information to inform the way she would play the piece today um, but there were, there were a lot of different themes, also the, 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 the women composer, and there were all these different, it was complex. And uh, anyway, this is going to be published in the next month or two, and we, you guys can look it up. But this, how, how did she know how they played it? Is it really so clear in how it's written out that every, every player has written? The Absolutely piece not. Piece? She, through interviews and analyzing recordings, right? The, the piece was just you know, eighth notes and quarter notes and sixteenth notes with a, a dot it's or whatever. Not like an old, it's not really old piece. No, no, it's, I think it was written in 1950 or oh. 1940 or something. Oh. So, yeah, it was not so far back. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, exactly. So, uh, and this is kind of typical. So you guys might have a subject which has a lot of different facets to it. And, and that can take you into some areas where you don't really know what the relevance is, but it might be really interesting for you. That's something I really understand from my research. I, I, I got really interested in time and the way we experience time as a part of my research into speed. And uh, I, I, it's just way too much and it's a huge topic. So I, I'm, I'm grappling on how to bring that all together. Uh, uh, into something that's clear and specific. Okay. Uh, let's just... Oh, yeah, here's another one, which is interesting. Uh, how can I demonstrate the relation between ballet and viola by analyzing my movements when dancing ballet? 
and playing viola. So this is a violist who was a, also a ballet dancer. And she wanted to play in orchestra. And, she, and there are a couple, five or six famous orchestra, ballet pieces for orchestra, which where the viola is accompanying a solo. So then she looked at the choreographies of those, those ballet, and she looked at, and then she would learn those and then she would play the viola, and then something about the timing of the body would influence the way she would time the phrases. And then, to go really creative, she made her own choreographies to the music, and then danced it, and then used that to create new interpretations. So it was, uh, it was a really great, uh, both like a, a, a kind of typical historically informed interpretation plus a creative new interpretation method. So that's another thing which I, I want to tell you guys is uh, leave some space for creativity in your research. Um, and it may be, usually that's the best when it kind of happens at the end. First you do all the research and all that stuff and then come up with your creative solutions at the end. But, but definitely leave some space. Okay, I will put the rest of the questions uh, online. I'll, I'll send you this PowerPoint, and then, uh, and then you guys can look at that. And if we want to talk more about it, by all means. Are there any questions till now? Guido. Does there have to be some relevance to others, or is it only applicable to you and therefore interesting for you? Uh, I think... It doesn't have to be uh, conceived as relevant for others. Right. But, you know, when you talk about your art, that is going to be relevant for others. Right? But it doesn't have to be structured so that it's uh, for other people. Yeah. The first question on this page is a master's research? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it a bit like, because this is she wants to play only one piece uh, in an informed way. And she spent two years on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so she, she went pretty deep into it. And that's why all these different facets were there. Uh, like I said, you could do, you could do two years on, on how to play one note if there's enough to, to do with that one note. Um, so this is this is kind of it depends on you guys on where your question is. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, she probably went off and did other things with her teacher and other excerpts. And, Absolutely. You know, yeah. it's not like it's yeah, wasn't the only it. thing she did for two years. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it 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 could very well be that uh, you know you don't want to have something that it's going to drive you nuts after a year. Like, ah, oh, I still have to play the same damn piece, you know? So, uh, in her case, I mean, there were some other pieces by this composer for oboe, so she also looked at those. And, uh, and she kind of got into this uh, historical uh, research thing. So, uh, you know, she kept it interesting. And then the playing was, was just one part of it. So, but, you know, <clears throat> for all of you, you know, don't, don't lock yourself into something. Don't lock yourself into something that, you know, you think that you're going to, what you're going to want to move on past in the next six months. But I, I found what you said about her research more interesting about what she's, what I perceived from her question, that she wanted to shed a light on this artist that's you know, Yeah. Yeah. So that's like basically her motivation that I don't see in the... Other questions. questions. Well, absolutely. So maybe, uh, you know, some of them are more matter of fact and some of them have more roots or other uh, inferences or connotations. Or, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. These are all examples from Rotterdam, I think. Yeah. 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 Because I can show you later, I'm from the library, hello. And I can show you later the master's thesis uh, from our students here. Great. Which might be of interest for you. And they are all online at the student portal thing. 
So uh, if you would like to have other examples and read whole pieces for ideas or for some inspiration, I will show you that. Awesome. Yeah. And I need to get those questions too and work them into this PowerPoint. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird to be showing Rotterdam. But anyway, it's, I also teach there, so uh, yeah. it's, the same, it's the same me. So, uh. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what a great introduction to Miriam Iris. She is from the library. I, I'm assuming you all know her, but if you don't, here she is. And um, she's going to talk to us about some of the awesome uh, resources they have there yeah. and how to get to them. So, uh, yeah, why don't you come and you can plug in your laptop? Yeah. And I will... Uh, Oh, you're still recording. You, do, would you, is yeah. it okay that I just yeah, leave that? No problem at all. Okay, great. Well, why don't you put your laptop here? Yeah. I think we just did this, right? Yes. I think that's the best way to do it. So we'll have a, a presentation by her, and then we'll have a break. Yeah, I will keep it short, unless there are a lot of questions. Yeah. I, I have to leave at 11, so I hope that's okay. very short. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to go, you can go. And Oh, and he's recording, so if you will miss a part, you can look it up later. Yeah. Or ask me, come to the library. Yes, she's very accessible. Uh, okay, hello, good morning. <laughs> Do you know the library? You, uh, you have been there already? Okay, that's great. <laughs> So I'm, uh, oh, it's it coming. doesn't work. It's coming. It's coming, a bit slow. Ah. Okay. <laughs> oh, it, the cable's out. I'm going to ask you for all my lectures. <laughs> she laughs at all my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we are. So this is the library, but you already know, understand? My name is Miriam Iris, I, and I will give you a short introduction about the library services and about a few databases, uh, how you can search, where you can search, how it works in the libra library and how it works uh, outside of the library. Okay, three pictures. Uh, now, you can study in the library if you want. There are a few, uh, several study places. Uh, you can come there with your own laptop or bring uh, or use one of these devices. Uh, a shot of our books. Now, let's speak for itself. You can uh, have rest at the library if you have had a long day <laughs> with your uh, uh, following colleges and research. I've taken many naps on those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when was it? In what year? I, yeah, it was I, not in the last. It was like two or three years ago. Two or three. Yeah. Okay, yeah. then I was there already, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, somebody said, oh, you're snoring too loud. <laughs> oh, was that you? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I and have to I wake up a student. And I found another place. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay, you can also snore in the library. No problem at all. It's in the, in the other building uh, at the top floor. So. Okay, two main topics for this uh, 10, uh, 20 minutes. First, I will tell you something about the collection that you uh, might have an impression what's in it for you, uh, what can be of interest for your research, and how you can search for resources. Now, first, I will start with our collection. Now, of course, in the library there are books, books and sheet music. Our main focus is on sheet music. Uh, the sheet music is categorized per instrument, solo instrument, uh, instrument with accompaniment of piano, but also chamber music. We also have a jazz and pop collection, but that's a bit smaller than our uh, classical collection, because mm. yeah, I think classical is the main part. There's more long history, you have to go and uh, the jazz and pop titles you can recognize at the yellow label. You cannot see it here, but if you see a yellow label at the back, then it's a jazz and pop title. Uh, so that's our sheet music. Um, 
We also have literature about music, but also literature more general. The literature which is about a specific instrument or about some soloist in uh, a specific kind of field, uh, for example, a, f a, famous, a famous violinist. Uh, that book is stored next to the uh, sheet music about violin. And uh, the same goes for all the other instruments. But if the, uh, the literature is more general, like history works or books about musical style, dictionaries or uh, yeah, more psychological titles, how to deal with stage fright, or about Alexander's technique. All that books are set apart. And uh, if you cannot find it, uh, you always can ask us and we show you around. What also is good to know, uh, what's also good to know, is that what you see in the library is not all we have. Because we also have a, a storage and the basement. Our collection is larger than you can see. So if you cannot find immediately what you are looking for, uh, please come to us or look it up in the catalog. And because maybe your book, your title is at another place in the basement. And then I have to go there and pick it up for you. And then you can get it. And what is also good to know is that uh, if you are missing a title, you, you, have, you have found a book which is really of interest for your research or just has your interest uh, anyhow, uh, and the library isn't in the possession of the book, you can ask the library to, to order the book. So you can come to us, uh, you have to fill out a little form with the title and the author, etc. And then we will order that for you. Very handy. So, it's okay, right. bye. No, yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> That's a nice one because sometimes these scholarly books that have an article that's really relevant for you mm -hmm. is like 150 euros. Yeah. Back yeah. on my check. So, uh, you can ask them and then I can buy it for you. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> books are really <laughs> expensive. Uh, yeah. 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 And the other option is to go to the university library. You can look it up if they have it there and you can also borrow from that library. But uh, that's an option, but the other option is to uh, order it, uh, or to, uh, to send a request uh, at, our, at our desk. Uh, we have uh, journals, magazines about instruments. Uh, we have uh, other libraries at the so HQ. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, if you are searching in our catalog, I will show you that later, then you are searching in all the four libraries of the HKU. Our library is called Library Maria Plaats, and uh, then you also have Library Jans Kerkhof, uh, where theater is situated. We also have a library at Oudenoord, where lots of studies are to together, uh, kunst and economics and that kind of stuff. And we have a library at uh, the IBB, LAN, and that's the Library of Fine Arts. And, uh, hey, but Mary Ears, yes. isn't all the relevant information that we ever need now on the internet and accessible by Google? Uh, there is a lot of information on the internet. Not all the information is accessible by Google. I thought someone was talking about Google Scholar already. I don't know if it was here or if the next, oh, it was the previous group. <laughs> but um, there, are, there is a lot of internet, but not everything is uh, full text accessible. Sometimes if you're looking uh, things up in Google Scholar, you will get the first three page pages for an impression. That could be handy, then you know what it is about. Uh, you can get a feeling if it might be of interest for your research. Uh, but then you can't read the full article. And I think at Google Scholar there are also links which link you to libraries who are in the possession of that book. So, uh, um, so you can uh, follow that line or follow our line and, uh, ask us for the book. So uh, to come back to your question, there's a lot of uh, information on uh, Google, 
not everything is full text accessible. And the second thing is that it's sometimes it's difficult to filter because there's an overload of information. And then you have really have to be critical what's in it for me. If you have uh, uh, fill out some keywords in the, in the browser, you have to really be critical and think, okay, what is this article about? Who is the author of the article? Is he an expert in his field? Does he work for a kind of institution? Or is it rather a kind of a hobbyist who is writing a blog from out of his own interest? Which could also be interesting, but maybe it isn't uh, that it uh, doesn't have the same quality as an article which is scholarly peer reviewed. So uh, ask yourself the question, who's the author? Uh, what kind of institution uh, do, does he work, he, she, uh, for whom is he writing this? And also, when did he wrote this article? Uh, did he wrote an article in 1999? Maybe that's a bit old. I think insights change, de develop uh, during time. So maybe there is more accurate information about uh, this specific topic. So uh, keep that in mind. When uh, did this, this person wrote the article? Um, I talked about the university library uh, already. Um, yeah, I think I s I've said it in the main introduction as well, that you can become a member of the university library for free. It's really nearby, you can walk. So uh, yeah, and I studied myself at the university library and I love the collection there. <laughs> A lot of books. <laughs> Less sheet music. I think if you are looking specific for sheet music, you better can come to our library. But <laughs> if you are interested in more scholarly literature, you really have to go there and just, yeah, just walk to, through the shelves and look at the books, to, uh, look up things in the catalog. And uh, yeah, um, you don't have to read an uh, immense collection of books there, but just grab some books read a few pages, look up at the index and get a feeling if the information is related to your own topic, if it might be of interest for you. And uh, yes. That's Utrecht University Library? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's a Utrecht University Library. It's at the uh, Drift 21, I think. The, the so are the two, the HKU Library and the Utrecht Library, they're like totally connected, so we can use your library to no. work. It's, uh, as, as far as I understand, if we want to use the, the Utrecht library for our for the students here, we have to go there, right? Yeah. And we can sign up for it? Yeah. Yeah, they are not connected. Now, they are connected in a way that we have an agreement with the Utrecht University Library that our students, the students of the HKU, can become a member for free at the Utrecht. It was really easy. Right. Okay, w uh, what was it about? Can you tell what you have to do uh, when you? Uh, I'm doing a, a piece, a Brahms, Brahms Requiem, and I wanted to have some performers analysis. Yeah. And uh, I picked it up. Okay. And they told me how to become a member, fill in this. Okay. Like, fill fill in the form, and then you you get a card, I think. I don't have a card. Okay. So Pete and I are Utrecht University students, so we can become, we can become HKU. HKU library people? Yeah, you, you are already HKU already library there. people. That's, that no, goes no. automatically. These are not students here. They're university students. They're doing a joint course. So they are participating in this class. Oh, you are? Uh, yeah. They're oh, from I the thought they were all. Only these two. Are we university are oh. So the question is, can university students ah. do the same with our library? Oh, OK, now I, now I understand. Yeah. I thought they were all. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> yeah, it's we can talk later. It's okay. We talk later, but I think we have to fix that. We only, yeah, we pay, for, the HKU pays for using the library at the uh, university. 
Smith Universe. He doesn't pay us for. I don't for... know if I need the HP library. I'm just kind of like getting yeah. Yeah. my head to it. Yeah. 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 But that's a good question. I will come to that uh, later. Oh. <laughs> so that's uh, about the university library. Uh, what is your study? Do, do you study musicology or? Uh... Musicology. Okay. With a music education focus. Okay, the master's program. Yes. Okay, yes. nice. Yeah. And as well as teachers too. Yeah, and who's the other person? Oh, you, okay. <laughs> yeah, I studied there a long time ago, in 2004, mm -hmm. 2002, 2004, 6. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, recordings, CDs, but the collection is a bit old fashioned. Old fashioned because we aren't working on that anymore, because we now also have a streaming service. And that might be of interest if you um, would like to compare pieces, for example. You are interested in, uh, what was the name of that uh, female Dutch composer? Uh, Annie Frenzel Wegenen. Wegenen, I never heard of her. But yeah. <laughs> Maybe she is on the streaming service. We can check that later. I don't think so. Yeah. But maybe more common pieces. For example, a Mendelssohn or a Bach, no, all the great composers you can and find. Henriette Bosmans. Henriette Bosmans, yeah. I think. I think she's, uh, she's probably there. Yeah, she's no, probably there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dutch. Yeah. Um, okay, that's about our collection. Any questions so far? So far? Okay. How to search? Now, there are different uh, options. Um, you can start at our catalog. You can access the catalog from home. Um, I think the best way to go there is to start at the student portal. I think the service Bali already talked about how to access the student portal. And if you are on the student portal, you can go to the library page and there is a link to the catalog. This is our catalog. Um, I switch to English. There are two options, advanced search and free text. If you have some specific information or you want to narrow, narrow your search results, you can start with advanced search, type, would you like to have a book? Would you like to have a recording, sheet music? Uh, which library, which medium, etc. But the easiest way is to start with simple search. Wegener, I don't think we have any. Yeah. Try again, nothing, nothing in our library. That's a pity. Okay, try again. You got specific letters that if you misspell a word, you're done? Yeah, well, you're done. It's not a fuzzy search. <laughs> but you don't have to uh, type the whole name. For example, if you, now, Shostakovich, all, that name always gives problems because you can write it in different manners. In Dutch it's S, J, O, and in English it's S, A, H, O. But you don't have to type it. Uh, you don't have to type the full word. So if you only type Shosta, you also get results with Shostakovich. If you are not sure about the ending of the word, for example, you can leave that part out. And here you see, library. Oh, all the books are in the Maria Plaats. Okay, that's no surprise because we are a music library. And, uh, now here you see, uh, sound recording, sheet music, book, 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 sheet music. Available, yes, yes, on loan. And available means that it can be in our library, but also in the basement, for example. So, uh, now, just play a bit with it, type some words. Uh, I think it, uh, yeah, I don't have to show that anymore. Um, you can, uh, you can try that. This is our catalog. The second one. The university library, you two are the experts in the <laughs> university library search uh, systems, I think. A well, little bit. <laughs> yeah, what I, oh, switch to English. So, what I 
do most of the time. I start with search engines, search worldwide, and start with the world cat search. Yeah. Okay. Wegener, now you see. Oh, that's a lot of results. <laughs> what was the first name of the... Emmy. Emmy. With... A-M-M-Y. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that narrows the search results. Yeah. If you add <laughs> too much information, be more it's specific. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's an old name. It's an old name? Well, no, my name, the Pete. Like, it's... it's all the people on the platform are called Pete, basically, in the Netherlands. Pete, oh yeah. <laughs> Pete Ke oh, Pete Ketting, you're yeah. referring to that, yeah. Uh, now you see, you are searching in libraries. Hey, I switched to English, but now uh, worldwide, worldwide. Uh, if you uh, would only have the results of the Utrecht University Library, you just click on this. And how many results are left? Oh, 39. Okay, nice. So, this is the Utrecht University Library. And you can find a lot of things online as a PDF or an ebook, which is quite nice. That's important, I think, what you're saying right now. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, Utrecht University has a lot of, I mean, I guess, scanned articles or just uh -huh. things that are maybe are only online. Yeah. And there are books that are only physical. Mm -hmm. Both are, uh, you can find them on WorldCat. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's super nice, I think. I'm not sure how that works for HQU students, but there's also a browser extension you can download in combination with this library, mm -hmm. which then, if you look at an article online and they might have it in their library, it automatically says, hey, this article is available in the library, so you don't need to look it up here specifically. But let's say you're a Google Scholar, and you find a certain article. I haven't used it that much yet, but I understand that then it refers you to the university paper, so it's easier for you to get it and read it. Because yeah. they have a lot of licenses for like pieces that you normally couldn't read, but well, they have the access to it, so it's yeah. quite nice. But you have to be a member of the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of advantages to uh, yeah. In this case, though, when you typed in Beginner for our Christian Beginner, so it must have, did it bring up two things? Would you put a name in quotation marks to yeah. be a little more specific? Yeah, that's a good one indeed. Uh, maybe we can. Yeah, we get too deep into it. No, uh, hey, if my mouse uh, doesn't want what I want. Mm, no, I, uh, yeah, the, you are referring to uh, the quotation marks, if you do it like this. My computer is about to die. Okay, there it is again. Wegener. Then, I'm curious how many research results do I get? Just one, worldwide. When you are using the quotation marks, uh, the, the database, the search engine is uh, searching for only this combination. Emmy, Patsy, Wegener. If you are leaving the quotation marks out, the uh, search engine is searching for uh, Emmy somewhere in the text and Wegener somewhere else in the text. And they are not necessarily related. But in this case, they are related because they are uh, after each other. Emmy, Fati, Wegener. He's specifically looking for this combination of words. You see, indeed, in the text, Dutch composer, model of Emmy Wegener. But she, oh, this is about Frenzel Wegener. Yeah, and Emmy is her model. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good one. Thank you. Um, time flies, I think. And if you would like to have a break, I have yeah. to speed up. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe I can... Okay, I just, uh, we talked about the Google Books. You can 
uh, look that up yourself. I would like to show you the master thesis be because we yeah. were discussing that part already. A, oops. A, I have to go to the escape. Sorry guys for this. There we are. There we go. Okay. Then I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Don't touch it anymore. This is our library page on the student portal. And this is Library Maria Plans. And these are the theses of the students. You have to fill in your HKU password. And then you are there. Okay, all these theses you see are master theses. And on the left side, you can see now roughly the topics uh, of the research. So music analysis, it's also in English, but it takes a while to switch. This I leave it in Dutch for now. Psychology, popular music. Uh, guitar. Now uh, I can click on some yeah. which instrument do you uh, play? Just uh, name an instrument. I can click on it and then see if it's there's any uh, piano. piano. Okay. Click on piano. Where is piano? Here. 31 results. Of Chopin. Chopin. And the, and the, and the, and the shelves, they, they, they were not. They were, they were not. No, no. Okay, and then you were talking about cheap music or uh, literature. No, no, um, I don't know how to, to find it. Yeah, now I yeah, show us that I have to use the yeah. electronic. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, to find, no? Yeah. Yeah, but what I'm. I'm showing right now is uh, these theses are only uh, online available. And yeah. where can I find them? Because I, I didn't know the... Uh, okay, I can, I can start with the student portal, at the student portal. Yeah, it's a really long way. <laughs> no, but I was searching and I didn't... Oh, you... you was, but, yeah. Okay, now this is the starting page, the home page of the uh, student portal. I think you have to go to Locatie Zaken. Oh, and then, yeah, that's a bibliotheken is also called Mediatheken. You go there, click on that. Okay. Libraries. Libraries. Oh, you're in the, in yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, I have to do a nee, no, English. I'm not in the <laughs> <laughs> But the other students are. Uh, yeah, this is uh, English, locations. Oh, here, HKU libraries. And then click on Library Maria Plaats, and then here's your thesis. Oh, unfortunately, all these uh, these overview of topics isn't yet in the English version. I have to fix that because it should be there, but it's a technically uh, thing. Technical thing. But they are also at the English page, and they are full text readable. So. Here you see a whole, uh, on paper. The thesis from last year's students are in it yet because I think they, they have to be finished uh, still, I think. I still can find it. Oh, you should still can find There's a difference between the English and the English. Yeah, there's a difference in the. Uh, right? Yeah. The yes. I found it. Uh, also on the English. Yeah, but I found it. Maybe I can have it. Oh, we have it now. You have it? Okay, great. So good to know if you would gain some information or inspiration from other, if you would like to see what uh, students have done before, you can look, look in our uh, thesis uh, database. Okay, the last two thought short things is the Oxford Music Online. And the Oxford Music Online is 
the big large dictionary for about here here it is it's like wikipedia but on the color version of wikipedia and much bigger and much more information and i think did you use it already at the uh, at the university library the oxford music online i haven't used it yet used mm. it. yeah no. so I, I haven't seen it i haven't had any reason to yet okay yeah. yeah this is a really good uh online source this oxford music so when you're looking up a composer or a basic thing or repertoire take your definition from oxford music don't grab it from you know joe smith's uh, blog something <laughs> <laughs> yeah. against joe smith <laughs> yeah <laughs> i do <laughs> yeah. 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 i've used this before but it was through like a server of my university so yeah. is there any way to yeah you go through and you can sign in via your hk yeah, yeah but you have to be in between the walls of the hku we don't have uh, access from home because that's much more expensive but if you are with your own device somewhere in a building of the hku just type oxfordmusiconline.com that's and right. then you I automatically there, signed in yeah and it says automatically signed in hku yeah. So if you're on the HKU Wi-Fi, oh, hey, this is it goes to the, then you get in. But if you try to do it from your home Wi-Fi, you won't get in. Okay, I thought I was showing you right now the Oxford Music Online, but uh, unfortunately not. No. Was it there? The si no. no, it was never there. Okay. okay. <laughs> but that's okay, now we know. I'm talking, I'm talking, <laughs> you don't see anything. It helps to look at your screens. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a uh, sorry did, for that. Did you mean to show all those funny cat videos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really great. Really yeah, oh, damn. <laughs> okay, the last one. Now uh, you will <laughs> even oh, no. see that. Is the um, our, we have a subscription to Nexus Music uh, Library. You can access that from home. Uh, it's a great streaming service. Uh, um, about nou ja, het is een streaming service, um, lot of records, not only from the Naxos label, but also other labels. And the plus above uh, uh, Spotify or other uh, streaming services is that you can, for example, it's one plus, that you can read the booklets full text. So if you also would have more information about this specific recording, you can. Um, have a look at the booklets as well. You only you can do it from home. You just have to type nexos.hku.nl and then you get access. And uh, then you uh, you have to fill in your uh, HKU password. And then you and then you are in. Yeah. yeah. Nexos.hku.nl. Yes. So I don't try this anymore. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great library. So if you, yeah. you know, if you want to have some recordings or pieces or you know, really check it out because you'll see a lot of good stuff there. Is it mainly classical or also more? Than no, classical. we have three uh, three packages. We have the classical and jazz and pop and world. So mm -hmm. if you yeah. are in it, you have to make a choice. You in see the three options, okay. and then you can mm -hmm. choose what you yeah. like. So, are there any questions? Uh, if you come up with questions later, you can come to the library. Daily oh. open from 10 till 4. Mm -hmm. And I'm there, or my colleague is there. And he's also no, So don't, don't think, don't assume that all, everything you can find, you can just find it in a Google search. It's really uh -huh. not true. Uh, like Mira Mir said, it may, Everything may be there, but it might be on the 343rd page of the Google results. But Joe Smith's blog <laughs> will be right at the top. So then you'll think, oh, okay, I guess that's the only thing out there, which is really not the case. And, uh, and, and like we said about this idea about argument, ar making an argument, you want to build your, ar your the argument of your research based on the knowledge which is out there. So you want to get the good knowledge.
because it really makes puts your your arguments on, on strong feet and legs. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. So there's a great resource resource here in the library. Just go use it, and you know, and in the university library, go geek out there, and, and you know, if you have an afternoon free, go and see what you can find, and you know, this is what you're here for. We also yeah, love sheet music in, in your basement. What? Just like here, we also have a lot of sheet music, but then in our basement. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you have to get maybe a certain access to it, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah you have to question. ask an uh, employee of the yeah. Um, library. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they are more serious, I think. Yeah, yes. I mean, they're giant books. I haven't been inside. Yeah. Like, I could see <laughs> the, the window and just like these yeah. things like here. Yeah, they are great. <laughs> yeah, serious. Yeah. Okay, that's it for now. All right, let's take a break. Let's, uh, what is it now? 11.25. Uh, okay, 15 minutes. Yeah, good. And then we're gonna we'll come back and then we're gonna do a little group exercise or we're gonna break into groups and work on your research questions. Yes. This class goes till 12:30. 12:30. Shall I stop the video or just press yeah, yeah. this right? Yes. Yeah,